I think that's where we're at. I don't know where we left off last week. It was... Oh, we were in John. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not know what I would do now. <laughs> yeah, I think we stopped at verse 18. In chapter 1? Yeah. I think you are correct. Okay, so, because chapter 1 is actually really long. This is 1. It's yeah. like, it's what, 51 verses or something, so. Let's just look at verses 19 through, like, 34-ish today. Okay, and this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Okay, so, you know, again, just to reiterate a couple of things we've said about the Gospel of John. So, the Gospel of John is probably, not even probably, it is, in my opinion, the most sacramental of the four Gospels. Even though there is no account of the institution of the Lord's Supper in John. There is no account of Jesus' baptism in John. It's just John saying, oh, this is the one about whom I said, I saw in the past this happened, and I'm telling you what happened. But you don't see that first person account of his baptism. And then neither do you have the institution of the Lord's Supper, although you have an entire chapter of the Bread of Life discourse that what else is that about other than the Lord's Supper? But that is what John's gospel does. It fills in blanks, it reiterates, and it reinforces things that are taught in the first three gospels. Uh, that's why we'll see this long, like five chapters get spent on Monday, Thursday. You know, Monday, Thursday, the other gospels is like this much. You know, uh, they did the Lord's Supper, then they went to the garden, the disciples fell asleep, Jesus got arrested, boom, and then it moves on to the trial. You know, in John, it's oh, this is all the stuff Jesus taught us that night. And it goes on for several chapters. Uh, the high priestly prayer, the uh, discourse he had on the way to the garden with them. We have all this stuff that is not recorded otherwise uh, that John recorded. Uh, so John's gospel serves a purpose, a purpose of uh, highlighting, reinforcing, and highlighting Jesus' divinity, which is interesting that our gospel reading this morning was what it was. Right, so we're highlighting Jesus' divinity where the others show his divinity, sure, but they really highlight Jesus as a man. John's gospel really shows him as God. Yep, so that said. All right, so this week we're talking about John the Baptist, the man who was sent by God, tells us he came as a witness will listen to his testimony. So who are the Jews of Jerusalem? What do you mean by that? So, uh, and this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him. So who are these Jews? Pharisees. Pharisees oh yeah, they're definitely going to be Pharisees because Pharisees are the ones that are in power. Any guesses as to who that is? Because they're going to figure highly during Holy Week. Okay, so these this is the San. These are members of the Sanhedrin. All right, so the, the Sanhedrin, a Sanhedrin. The, this is how how Jewish religious culture work, 
back then. So when you had enough people in a town, you could have a, a synagogue. And then when you had enough people in the synagogue, you had to put together a Sanhedrin, a ruling council. So they would automatically, when you had enough guys, they would say, okay, now we have to put together a ruling council. And so since the Pharisees were the branch of Judaism that are in power right now, there's still multiple branches of Judaism today. Uh, but the Pharisees are the ones that won. That's basically what Israel is today and what Jews today are, Pharisees. Uh, the Pharisee party kind of won. Uh, although there's a lot of Sadducee Jews out there. There are a lot of Jews that no longer believe in an afterlife. They believe once you're dead, you're dead. Oh, uh, really? Most, uh, yeah, so there are, there are still some of those. Uh, so the ruling council this, of the Jews, the Sanhedrin, which are the ones Jesus will be put to trial by uh, in the clown court they put together for him. So this is the ruling council of the Jews. So these are like guys going, something's going on down by the Jordan. We need to go check it out. All right. So these are the Pharisees, this is a ruling council, um, and they were sent to find out who he is. Who is John? Because John's a, like, whose authority? They, the Pharisees are always going to ask that question of Jesus. By whose authority are you doing this? And actually, what we should watch, there's these fantastic gospel movies um, where they go word for word from the Bible as they act it out. Uh, and the one for the Gospel of John is really good. It uses the NIV, which is fine for what we're doing. Uh, but you get to see them, like all the background talking is Aramaic or Greek or whatever. So they're using, it's really made to look authentic. It's like shot of location in the Holy Man. Uh, and they go through the entire gospel word for word as they act it out. Uh, and you really pick up on some nuances of what the original language actually means when you see it act, acted out. So we should do that. We'll start next week. We'll start watching it the part that we're going to read, we'll watch it. Um, and then we'll wind up watching the whole gospel. But it's, it's worth doing. It's worth, it makes it kind of come alive. Um, now everybody look at Mark chapter 1, verse 5. And see if you can tell me if there was a possible, another possible reason for their interest in John. 1, verse 5. Mark 1, verse 5. Okay, so it says, And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him, John the Baptist, and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So why do we think the Pharisees went out to find out what John was doing? Because he's pulling him from the church. Because he's everybody in the world is going out there. You know, it says every, everyone from the surrounding country. Everyone is going there to get baptized by John. So let's talk about baptism in the Bible. Let's talk about John's baptism, and we'll talk about Jewish baptism. So... Uh, Interesting, the word baptism is interesting. Our word baptism is a direct transliteration from the Greek word baptizo, which means to wash. Uh, so that's all it means, to wash with water. Now in ancient Greek, like Attic Greek, like we're talking ancient Greek as in like, uh, you know, ancient Greek, the 300, right? Ancient Greek thousand years, two thousand years ago, two thousand years before Jesus. So Attic Greek, the word baptizo meant to submerge underwater. Then the word came because words change definition over time, unfortunately. So then around Jesus' time, in Koine Greek, common Greek, everyday street Greek, which is what the people spoke, it just meant to wash, simply to wash. It's interesting that it used to mean to dunk, right? Uh, now it just means to wash. So uh, baptizing things was a thing. You wash things. Now the, uh, the Jews would ritually wash things to make them clean, uh, to make them ritually clean. Uh, so they were baptizing all kinds of stuff. They would baptize dishes. They would baptize dining couches. They would baptize chairs. 
They would baptize, because baptize just means to wash. They were baptizing everything. And now John all of a sudden is baptizing people. Now we have, you know, put this definition on this word baptize because we borrowed it right from the Greek language, but then we use it to mean something else. And we'll talk about what it means to us as we move forward. But it, the Jews were familiar with baptism. Uh, another thing that happened was if you became a God-fearer. Anybody remember what a God-fearer is? So a God-fearer is a Gentile convert to Judaism, but you can't become a Jew. You can only uh, become a God-fearer. You can worship the one true God, the God of Israel, but you can't actually become a Jew because you have to be born a Jew. It's a race. Uh, so you couldn't convert to become a Jew, but you could become a God-fearer. That's why the temple had that court of the Gentiles. That's what that was for. So that was where the God-fearers would gather to worship. So they worshiped the same God. They, they observed all the observances. But they couldn't be a Jew any more than I could be African-American because I'm white. I'm not born African-American. Just like they said, you can't be a Jew. You have to be born a Jew. Okay, it's a race. But you could follow their religion, follow all of their laws and observances, uh, you could adopt their religion. You had to get circumcised. That was the thing. But you couldn't be a Jew. That was your race of the Jews. You couldn't be one of them, but you could be like one of them. One of the things you had to undergo was a baptism. You had to be ritually washed and, and declared ritually clean as part of your conversion process. Uh, and then you could go in the court of the Gentiles and you could worship. So the court of the Gentiles wasn't for your average Gentile, it's for your god fearers these people who have adopted that religion, that faith, and made it theirs. Uh, so that was a thing, and it's a thing in the New Testament also. Well, when did it change? Because now people can convert to Judaism. I don't know. Sometime after the destruction of the temple, uh, but when that exactly happened, you'd probably have to find a rabbi and ask them. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so now, yeah, you can become good. The, the interesting thing about Judaism is they don't, they don't proselytize. They don't look for people to become Jewish. You know, like, we evangelize, you know, you need to become a Christian, right? You know, we do that. We go out and try to make disciples of all nations, right? Jews have never done that. It's like, they don't, they don't want, yeah, you can, you can become Jewish if you want, but they don't go actively seeking converts. And yet, people still become Jews. So, uh, so that's the deal with with the baptism. So, that baptizing is not something new. It's like, oh, John is out doing this baptism for the forgiveness of sins in the Jordan. Well, baptizing is new. Baptizing is not new. They've been doing that for a long time. Baptizing for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, now we're doing something novel. You know, and on top of John's weird, right? You know, he wears weird clothes. He talks like a prophet. You know, he sounds weird. He looks weird. He's like all wild looking. He lives in the wilderness. He eats locusts and honey. I mean, he's a strange guy. And now he's out there baptizing for the forgiveness of sins. So, yeah, the ruling party of the local religion is going to come out and go see what's what. So that's everybody's second baptism. Because they've already been baptized. Mm -hmm. The converts to Judaism, the converts to become God-fearers, those guys got ritually washed. Okay. Don't think of baptism like we think of baptism. Okay. So just think they had to be ritually washed, which the word for that in Greek is okay. baptism. Then we took that word and made it ours, like we do all kinds of words. We borrow directly from other languages. So we just borrowed the word baptism directly from another language, transliterated into English, and baptizo becomes baptized. <clears throat> Uh, and that, that's it. Uh, and then, of course, we have given it meaning because of what God has given it meaning to us. But we just stole it from another language, the word. We didn't come up with a new word. Uh, we just took theirs directly. Um, okay, but this idea of this special washing, nothing new. But the washing for the forgiveness of sins, hmm, that's a little new. So let's see. So... They go out there, and they're like, well, okay. And they ask him, who are you? And he confesses. First thing he confesses is what? What does it say? Verse, yeah, so verse 20. 
They ask him who he is, and he says, who he's not, first of all. I am not Christ. I'm not the Christ. So let's nip that in the bud right now. I am not the Messiah. Okay, so Messiah, Hebrew, means Messiah. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. So they both mean the anointed one of God. Uh, so the Christ, Christ is a title, not Jesus' last name. You know, so that's why a lot of people, like Paul, will write Christ Jesus. Christ is his title. It's like Mr., Pastor, Dr., Christ. It's his title. Uh, so Christ, Messiah, same thing. It means the anointed one. Uh, and he says, okay, right off the bat, I'm not the Christ. Oh, okay. Well then, who are you? Are you Elijah? Why did they ask him if he's Elijah? Does anybody remember what happened to Elijah? Elijah. He didn't die. Yeah, he didn't right, die. he was to taken to heaven. <clears throat> yeah. So he's never he never died. So then they thought maybe he could come again. Yeah, if you look at Malachi 4 5 is where that comes from. Let's look at Malachi, last book of the Malachi, is it Malachi 4 5? Oh, yeah, Malachi, last verse of the Old Testament, actually. So Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Okay, so I will send you someone like the great prophet Elijah. Uh, if you look at Malachi 1, 1, it talks about my messenger. So that's who John the Baptist is. He is that prophesied Elijah. Because what did Elijah preach? What was Elijah, what, did, what did Elijah do? He preached repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Right? He told the people to repent or they will be you know, damned. Right? That's what prophets do. Uh, so that's all John is doing. It's not that John is the reincarnated Elijah or that Elijah came down in the form of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a prophet like Elijah in, in, the, in the manner of Elijah, preaching the same thing Elijah did. That's what prophets do. And John's the last prophet. Uh, and he's preparing the way. Right? So he goes, no, I'm not, I'm not Elijah. Okay, are you the prophet? Okay, when it says, are you the prophet, do you know who they're talking about? Okay, it's Moses. So are you the prophet, capital P, they're talking about Moses. Was Moses a prophet? Yeah, I mean, yeah. A prophet is not someone who tells the future. A prophet is someone who tells the word of God to people. You know, in that respect, I'm a prophet. Okay, but Moses told, related what God told him to the people. That makes him a prophet. Okay, so prophet's not a fortune teller. And a prophecy is not, well, prophecy, yeah, is a foreshadowing or a telling of the future, but one who prophesies is just one who tells the words that God has given him to speak. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean telling the future. That's what it means to us today. Again, words change meaning over time. Okay, so are you the prophet? Are you Moses? No. All right, so you're like, okay, you're not Elijah. You're not Moses. Then who are you? We have to go back and tell the ones that sent us, hey, you guys, go out to the Jordan and find out who this guy is. Okay. Well, hey, are you this? Are you that? Because, you know, Scripture says these are not dumb people. They're like, well, you know, they said Elijah's going to come again. Are you Elijah? No. Okay, are you Moses? No. Well, then, how are you? <laughs> tell us. And what does John say? I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. He quotes the Old Testament to him, another prophet, what Isaiah said. All right. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Who else cried out in the wilderness? Back in the day. The children of Israel, right? They were, in, they were, yeah. they were crying out in Egypt, and then God rescued them. So a theme that's going to run through John is the Exodus. So you have this, the children of Israel crying out to be released from Egypt, and God will take them out of Egypt through the Jordan, this baptism imagery of going through the water into the wilderness where they're going to wander for 40 years, but that was their own fault. 
and then God delivers them to the promised land. That theme is going to run as an undercurrent in John. You're going to have this, this language of God's people being delivered from sin, a second exodus, uh, exodus from sin. Uh, so they were captive in Egypt. We are captive to sin. Christ will release us from that captivity. All right, now John parenthetically goes, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. John puts these details in there. That's another thing John does. What's what all the evangelists do? That's what gives it uh, the ring of truth as an eyewitness account, as opposed to a legend or a myth, uh, which a lot of people today go, oh, the gospels are a myth or they're legends. Um, so I get a little sidetracked here, but I'm gonna go on that tangent anyway, because it's important. So. When you read a myth or a legend, it has a certain epicness to it, right? When you hear about Zeus coming down from the mountain. What's Mount Olympus. Mount Olympus, thank you. I have too many mountains today. So Zeus comes down from Olympus and he does mighty deeds, right? He's throwing lightning bolts and he's becoming a shower of gold and uh, all the other neat stuff he does, right? Uh, and he puts mighty heroes in play, and there's no details. It's just like you don't know you don't you don't know all the details about about um, Apollo. You don't know all the details about Hera. You just know who she is, what she does, vaguely, because she's a goddess, and you know these things, but you don't know details. Uh, myths are like that. They don't have the minutia. They don't have the backstory. Right. That's why our that's an interesting trend in our modern legends and myths. And I'm thinking of Marvel, right? In DC, I'm thinking of comic books. I'm thinking like the Avengers. Okay, we have all these details. We want the we want a superhero's backstory. We want all that stuff uh, because it makes the universe that much more rich for us. And we can argue on the internet about stuff that, that makes no difference uh, because it makes those heroes real and because it makes them human. But in traditional epic poetry, you don't have all these details. Um, the Gospels do. They, we have days of the week. We have what time of day. We have, oh, these guys were from the Pharisees. Oh, these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan. We have places. Usually epic legends don't have that kind of detail. Uh, you know, it was, it was six in the morning when Hercules... It was six in the morning and the sun was coming up when Hercules cleaned out the Aegean stables. It, we don't have that. It just said Hercules diverted a river and cleaned out the Aegean stables. That's it. Myths have a certain quality to them. Eyewitness accounts have a different quality to them. The Gospels don't have the quality of myth. Uh, they, don't, they have too much detail, too much first-person narrative. Uh, to be myths, which we know that because we believe they are what they are, but people still try to make this myth argument. Second of all, myths evolve out of stories and they become epic, right? So people told the stories of the Greek gods for a long time and they became epic. You know, Norse men sit around in the winter when there's nothing else to do and they told stories and the myths of Thor and Odin and Loki and all these characters became epic. You know, there's not, you read those stories too, there's no details, there's few details. Um, you just have these epic stories about when the gods did this and that. Um, over time, the stories, who could have been actually based about actual people, some of them, become epic and that come huge and they become unbelievable. You can tell it's a myth. The Gospels were written down much too quickly for anything to have become myth. So you have the eyewitnesses who witnessed the things that Jesus said and did, and they wrote them down within a generation of the events that took place. That's not enough time for a myth to form. Because it's, oh, well, you know, over time and as the things were copied, you know, the story got more and more exaggerated. And all of a sudden, Jesus is this God man who rose from the dead. But that, that didn't actually happen. That just evolved in the story. No, it didn't. There wasn't enough time for that to happen. Plus, it happens, it was written down so quickly to the time, so close to the time, 
when the events took place, that people who were still alive, who knew about these things, if they hadn't been true, could have said, don't write that down, that's not true. Yet we have no such records. You know, there was plenty of time for people to write down. You know, there, these guys are telling you that Jesus rose from the dead, but we know that's not true, we saw the body. Do we have any of those? No, we don't. There was plenty of time when these witnesses were all alive that were all contemporary to these events could have written those accounts down. We don't have any. Why? Because there aren't any. Now they can say, oh, the church went around and destroyed them all. Yeah, okay, because the, the guys in an underground religion who were afraid every day that they were going to get killed for their faith we had the time and the ability to run around and find all these documents that prove Christianity is a made-up thing, and they destroyed them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that happened, sure. And you talk about myths. But th that's a digression. Uh, so, yeah. Not enough time, not nearly enough time for myths and legends to develop. That takes hundreds of if not a thousand, you know, hundreds of years to develop. You know, the Norse myths didn't just pop out of people's imagination one day. They, they took centuries of telling the stories to your kids. And they developed into these legends. You know, same thing with the Greeks. Uh, same with Roman mythology. They just stole other people's myths and put new names on them uh, and so on. All right, so the ruling council of the Jews sends their top men, right, to the Jordan to find out what John's doing. And they said, okay, if why are you baptizing? Why are you baptizing? If you are not the Christ, and if you're not Elijah, you're not Moses, what are you doing? And he tells them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one. You do not know that's Jesus. Uh, even he who comes after me. That's why I'm baptizing. I'm getting them ready to meet Jesus. So what's the first thing you do if you're going to meet God? Is what it, what's the first thing we do in church? Why do we do that? What's the first thing we do in the liturgy? We say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves in the truth that's not in us, or let us confess our sins. The first thing we do is confession. Before we even get started, we confess our sins, and that's what John's doing. He is having the people get a washing for the forgiveness of sins in preparation to meet the Messiah. So his baptism is a baptism of preparation. So he's just, all he's doing is preparing people spiritually for what is to come. John, other than that, John's baptism is nothing to do with ours. It's different. No Holy Spirit involved. This is purely a, a act of penance. You, you get washed and you ask for your sins to be forgiven. Question? Well, Jesus was sinless. He mm -hmm. got baptized. Yes, he did. But it's to be cleansed of your sins. Yes, he did. So why? Well, I'm sure I'll learn. Okay, because it was a sinner's baptism. So why did Jesus have to receive the sinner's baptism? Because he's going to receive that. Because he, he is going to become sin, right? So he is preparing to take on the sins of the world. So what do sinners do? They get baptized by John. That's what they did. So he went to be baptized by John. You know, Wasn't it foretold also that Jesus would see John and, and all that? I mean, in a way, yeah. Uh, but the, the, you know, because John's the one that says, oh, well, you're the one that should be baptized in me. He goes, no, no, let us do this. We have to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So it's like, okay, what does that mean? Well, that's in another account of Jesus' baptism, right? I think it's Luke. Um, so what, are, what righteousness are they fulfilling? Well, they're fulfilling the righteousness of God. So well, why does Jesus have to be baptized if he's not a sinner? Well, right, it's a sinner's baptism. And he's going to go in the water, he's going to receive a sinner's baptism, even though he's sinless, and what's going to happen is the heavens are going to open, the Holy Spirit is going to come down on Jesus, and the Father is going to say, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. So you have the whole Trinitarian experience right there, with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit anoints Jesus, you know, Jesus is anointed with the Holy Spirit, right? What does Christ mean? 
the anointed one. Huh? So this is Jesus, this is the Father putting the divine stamp of approval on his son and his mission. This is my son. I'm well pleased he's doing what I wanted him to do, which is to come be one of you and die for you. So that's why he has to be baptized, so that event could take place. So yeah, Jesus doesn't have to be washed clean because he's already clean, he's sinless. But he's going to be a sinner. He's going to live just like one of us. And what do one of us do with those days? You went to John and you got baptized in the Jordan. So he does that. And it also it is also a witness to this divine approval of him. You know, it's kind of like why did he have to go in the wilderness to be tempted? By the devil. Well, because the devil knows who Jesus is. I mean, right, he was created by Jesus. The, devil, the angels were created by God. So they know who he is, but it's like, oh, now he's in human form. This is new. I wonder if I can corrupt him like I corrupted these other ones. I'm going to go find out. And guess what? No. <laughs> That's why that has to happen. So, so this is, okay, God in human form, this is new. So all these things have to take place. Makes sense? Yeah. Okay. I mean, but that as far as him being baptized, would that be like a foreshadowing? Like, for the way we're baptized? Like he says, it's a... Uh, uh, I mean, in as much as we... Isn't in, in, in as much... Well, John even tells you, he goes, that it's different. You know, he says... <clears throat> I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptizing him with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And then, where does he say before that? It's not in John. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, it's not in John. It's in one of the other gospel accounts. Again, I think it's Luke. But he says, you know, I baptize with water. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I want to say that's Jeff. Is it, or is it Mark? I think it's Luke. Let's look real quick. Uh, John the Baptist. Yeah, so I baptize with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. All right? Uh, so that's the difference. Like John baptizes with water to prepare us to meet the Messiah. He's going to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then even Jesus was like, I have a baptism to undergo that you cannot, you know. Where was Jesus? Jesus says he has to be baptized with fire. Now, where is he baptized with fire? On the cross, right? So, um, so then he baptizes with fire and the Holy Spirit. Well, how does Jesus does baptize us with fire and the Holy Spirit? With fire, because he felt the fires of hell on the cross. And then with the Holy Spirit, because he anoints us with the Holy Spirit in the water of baptism, our baptism, the baptism he commands. So that's the difference. All right, so Jesus' bap Jesus' baptism by John, different, because that is him being introduced to the people of Israel, shows God's approval of him as his son on his mission. Uh, even a little different than the other baptisms John is doing to people. That is to prepare them to meet the Christ, and now this is the Christ, and then Jesus will command us to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that is different yet. That's completely different than John's baptism. You'll even see in the book of Acts, you'll talk about, you'll see people that were baptized with John's baptism. It even calls it people baptized with John's baptism who have not received the Holy Spirit. To even show it's not the same thing. So you're not automatically a Christian because you got baptized back way back when with John. And now you start following Jesus. Well, no, you do that, but they would be baptized in that case again different kind of washing. Well, that makes sense. There's a lot going on in this book in just a few verses. Okay. 
Question? I know too, it's too long. Okay. Sure. This baptism stuff gets confusing. Every time I have to teach it in confirmation, because they always go, well, why did you... It, it wind up, I have to study it the night before to make sure I say it right to the kids, because it's so easy to, like, get this all garbled up. Uh, but, yeah. I was hoping I wrote a paper about it, but I didn't. I wish, wish I really... <coughs> Because I'm throwing these papers I've written on the Gospel of John up on the blog also. There's a, there's a separate one that says Bible study, so you just click on it and you'll have, no, that's mixed in with the blog posts. I have sermons in a separate blog. So you can click on sermons, get my sermon manuscripts, but then on the, the daily meditations in there, until I move them and make a separate Bible study one, you'll see like digging deeper and like that stuff I read last week, that paper's on there. Uh, so if you want to read, read some of this stuff in deeper detail. But I don't think I did one on the, the differences between all the different baptisms in the New Testament. Uh, maybe I should. Yeah. I should really do that one of these days. Okay. Questions? What was your question? What is your question? Maybe it's not that long. Hmm. Sure. It's about baptism. I don't know. Okay. Okay. How does John, here's a good question for you. How does John describe his relationship to Jesus? kind of contrasting with what I kind of said in the sermon today where we think of Jesus as one of us, which is correct, he is one of us, but saying that, uh, you know, Jesus is my best friend, right, which is also true. There's nothing wrong with actually saying that, but, you know, he's the big guy, he's the dude upstairs. It's me and Jesus, we're tight, right? We're a little casual about it. What does John say about his relationship, which they're cousins, by the way, everybody knows yeah, that, right? Isn't John continually saying how unworthy he is? Yeah, what does he say? I'm not worthy to untie his sandal. I'm not worthy to untie the strap of his sandal. Who untied the strap of people's sandals? Jesus. No, no. the servants who watched it. Slaves. Mm -hmm. Okay, so your slave did that. They also are the ones that washed feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But Jesus did that to his... Yes, he did. Okay. All right. Or your servant. But yeah, slave. that's slave's work, so... John's relationship to Jesus is, I'm not even worthy to do a slave's job for him. That's what he said. Wow. Okay. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. All right. And then how does John identify Jesus? What does he call him? The next day, verse 29. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yeah. Okay, and how does he know that? How did John know who he was? Because he was told. Okay, who told him? The Holy Spirit, I think. Divine revelation, yes. Mm -hmm. He said if when he saw the dove descend upon him, I saw the Spirit descend as a dove from heaven, that that would be him. Yep. Yes, so God told him. You're going to see the Holy Spirit descend on one of these folks that you're going to baptize, and it's going to remain on him, and that's how you're going to know. And John says, okay, and then that's what he told. All right, so John receives divine revelation so that he could know who Jesus was. You know, before he was born, he knew who Jesus was just by being in his presence. You remember that, right? Yeah. Right, so John in the womb. leapt in the womb when his cousins his mom and his unborn cousin showed up. So he knew who he was then. But after they grew up a little, I guess they kind of, because John went out in the wilderness. So I have a theory. I think I'm not wrong. You know, John was dedicated to the Lord at birth. That's why he was off by himself. That's why he had the long hair. He was a Nazarite, right? You know what Nazarite is? So they were dedicated to God at birth. They couldn't cut their hair. They couldn't drink alcohol. And they just dedicated their life to God. Um, I'm trying to think who was 
And every time I do this, I forget who they are. I'll find out. I'll, I'll try to remember who they all are in the Old Testament, but we have examples of them in the Old Testament. Then you read the description of John, it's like exactly the same. Hmm. Uh, so he was you know, dedicated from his birth to be this foreshadower of Christ. Other than when he baptized Jesus and the Holy Spirit descended, when was John's interaction with either the Holy Spirit or God or when he's Probably at that time he lived in the wilderness. I mean, because I don't remember ever reading it. I mean, I'm no. not well read. I'm trying. To right. Read. Yeah. There's no narrative okay. that like okay, this is when this is when John the Baptist like went off. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just didn't have a right. yeah. There's we don't know that. Okay. That's what we just said. That's, that's what it. this is it. This is okay. what we know about him. Right. Um, you yeah, know, so we know that he went off, and it was like, well, when did Jesus learn all of his Torah? You know, and all that stuff. So we know he was in the temple teaching when he was 12, 13, right? 12, yeah. Right? But when did when did he receive all his training? I don't know, sometime between when he was 12 and when he was 30. We don't know. But that's about that age, right? About that age is when you become a rabbi. So right when Jesus' ministry starts, that was about the age for that. Uh, so he was following tradition. Because he could have been the Messiah. He could have started his ministry way earlier, but traditionally... Around that age is when you start teaching as a rabbi, after you've finished your education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right around there. Uh, so yeah, so that's how we, that's how John knew divine revelation. All right, and then now we have, uh, yeah, and I've seen, I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So it's like all these people that say, you know, Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. Um, yeah, like this morning's gospel reading, he couldn't got any more obvious. It's like, before Abraham was, I am. That's why they picked up stones. That's why they wanted to kill him right then and there, because he just called himself God. He's like, Jesus never claimed to be, if you've heard this. Well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Yeah, he did. Like, more than once, he claimed to be God. And that, this morning's gospel reading, that was the obvious one. But before Abraham was, I am Nobody has ever called themselves I am, but God. So, yes, he, yes, son of God. I honestly don't know where people get that, that he never claimed to be, but okay. All right, so John is bearing witness to this is the son of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then the next day, we're at verse 35. The next day. Again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. <clears throat> the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah. He brought him to Jesus, who looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John. You should be called Cephas, which means Peter. Right? So calling the first disciples. Come and, come and, well, teacher, where are you staying? Come and see. Where was he staying? That's a rhetorical question, by the way. And the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. They're probably like, where are you staying? Well, let me show you the rock I'm sleeping on today. Yeah, yeah. Right? I think he took them out into the wilderness, because that's where they're at. And he said, yeah, well, here, I'm kind of sleeping rough. Right? So uh, that's what I think. We don't know. I'm speculating. But I don't think he's staying in anybody's house. I think he's hanging out at a campfire. Right? The one of the few times where someone calls Jesus rabbi... And they're not about to get in trouble. Usually, if you've seen the Gospels, when they say, Rabbi, Jesus is getting ready to lecture them. Because usually they're asking him something not very nice. And they're calling him Rabbi almost sarcastically. Every time Jesus is addressed as Rabbi, that person is getting ready to get lectured at and get talked to. This is the only time like where somebody actually genuinely meet Rabbi, you know, your teacher. I'm asking you saying teacher because I want to be your disciple. Well, isn't that what rabbi is? When they call him rabbi, he teaches him something. He is the teacher. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, you know, the, usually it's a term of respect, but when they call Jesus rabbi, they mean it sarcastically well, or facetiously. Mary did at the tomb. 
when she thought he was the gardener. Mm -hmm. And when, she, when he said, you know, Mary, and she's like, Rab or Raboni or whatever. Yeah. Raboni, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, all those other places in the Bible, too, where they say rabbi or they're questioning him. It, it tells you he knows what's truly in their heart. Yeah. So. He knows, so yeah. So you were, I what verse forty two, I, I just I really like verse forty two. Like, what does that mean? Okay, he brought. Peter to Jesus. Jesus looked at him. So you are Simon, the son of John. <laughs> what? <laughs> does my like does my reputation precede me? It's like, what do you mean by that? I don't know. Again, I'm just having fun. So you're Simon, the son of John. Like, is he infamous? <laughs> infamous? You should be called Peter, uh, son of John. That's Jonah of the son of Jonah. That would be uh, Jonah of Bethesda, Matthew 16, 17. So Matthew 16, 17, I think should tell us something. Matthew 16, 17. Mm -hmm. Probably nothing. Yeah, Simon bar Jonah. So Simon, Simon son of Jonah. When you see all these different names, remember there's you're going to get the, the Aramaic name sometimes, and you're going to get the Greek name sometimes. Every now and then you get a Latin name, but mostly it's the Greek and the uh, Greek and the um, Hebrew, Aramaic. And Cephas. Means, I think means whale. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, well, we'll go a little further. So we can actually start chapter 2, which is awesome. Jesus is the wedding at Cana. It's a really great text. There is a lot going on in the wedding at Cana. So let's, let's finish up chapter 1 today. So the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. And Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Then Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened, and the angels of God descending and descending on the Son of Man. Okay, that got enigmatic very fast, right? You're having this conversation, we're picking up disciples, and all of a sudden Jesus goes, very Messiah on them. He starts saying strange things. So let's see what's going on. Okay. Uh, so Jesus' hometown, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Uh, there was an early church father called St. John Chrysostom, uh, St. John the Silver-Tongued, and he wrote a lot of sermons, which are pretty neat. Um, good early church father, not one, of the, not one of these guys that was right up tight to the apostles, but like we're talking several generations down but still a very, very early Christian, uh, early bishop of the church. And he wrote, uh, talking about Jesus, um, his mode of living was ordinary, his garments not better than those of many. For he was not girt with a leathern girdle, nor was his raiment of hair, nor did he eat honey and locusts, but he fared like all others, and was present at the feasts of wicked men and publicans, that he might draw them to him. And then Luther wrote, Christ chooses as his apostles the poorest and the lowliest he can find. So, um, nobody of high standing in society. Uh, Nazareth, where's Nazareth? Milanor. 
It's not a very important town, kind of like Bethlehem, not a very big town. Uh, small, out of the way. Because you think a big time prophet comes from like Jerusalem, right? No, it comes from Nazareth. So, okay, so Jesus saw Nathanael coming and said to him, Behold, Israel indeed, indeed in whom there is no deceit. Uh, what in the world is he doing? Well, Jesus is exercising his divine nature. He doesn't always do that. But he says, Okay, I know you are going to be a faithful apostle. You know, he's going to speak the truth of God's word. There's not going to be any deceit in him. Um, and he says, Before I. Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. And he's like, okay, how did you do that? So, okay, here's this miraculous sight that Jesus has of Philip. And Jesus is like, oh, yeah, you think that's something. You ain't seen nothing yet. You're going to see amazing things. And then you will see the angels, the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Okay, so first of all, this, this title, Son of Man, which comes from the Old Testament, you can see that in Isaiah and Ezekiel. So the Son of Man is another title for the Son of God. Uh, why Son of Man? Because when Jesus took on human, when the Son took on human form, became the God-man, Jesus Christ, now he looks like a Son of Man. He looks like one of us because he is one of us. He has a human body. So, son of man, you will see the prophets, you will see God speaking to the prophets, and the God will say to him, son of man, tell the people. So when he's speaking to the prophet, he will call the prophet son of man. Uh, but it's also a messianic title when Jesus is using it. So all these people are going to understand when he calls himself the son of man, that to prick up their ears of what, what he is referring to. <clears throat> Also, this word truly, uh, which uh, in some translations it'll say amen. So Jesus will do the double amen, 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 I say to you, or truly, truly, I say to you. Uh, that word truly, only Jesus uses that word in all the Gospels, that specific word uh, for truly. Uh, Jesus is the only one that uses it, uh, which is that word amen. The only person that uses that word is in the Gospels is Jesus himself. Um, yeah, we said that's why we end our prayers with amen. It means let it be so. And when Jesus uses it, is it is so. You know, it is so, it is so, I'm telling you. All right? Uh, and that's why John doubles it when he says it. Okay, you'll see heaven opened and the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So the Son of God, the Son of Man, the two natures of Christ, the Messiah. Who else saw uh, angels ascending and descending? Um, Jacob. Close. Uh, who, the one that ran your brother. Yep. Uh, or the one that got sold into slavery, actually. Yeah, jo Joseph. Yep. Mm -hmm. Joseph. Okay, so Joseph had this dream of the angels and descent, angels ascending and descending the ladder. Uh, that's what Jesus is referring to. So he's going to see, you're going to see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He is the way to heaven, in other words. So it's a little enigmatic, but he's saying, okay, you, you think that's something? Well, you're going to see that I am the way to heaven. And this whole thing that's about to happen, which is his passion, as we're going to be going into Holy Week here, starting next Sunday. You know, this whole... Why he came into our flesh wasn't just to walk around and preach and, and say nice things to people and heal. It's to die for the sins of the world. So that's going to be the really something that they're all going to be a witness to. So it's like, oh, you, you believe? Because I, I could see we're over there by the tree. You have to wait till you see what's coming. Wait till you see what's going to happen. Then you'll really believe, right? So that's all he's doing. He's foreshadowing his death already. So it's not just you're going to see these other signs. It's like you're going to see the sign, the reason for why he came. And I already know there is no guile in you. You will proclaim this to the world. 
faithfully. And then we don't really hear much about, about him, right? You know, Nathaniel, we really don't, we don't hear much about him. Just he's going to be a faithful. Right? Is that the word you wanted? Oh, it means run. Yeah, that's right. I knew that. I'm a dumbass. See if this means run. Yeah, because that is, see, that's the little joke. The little joke that Jesus means when he says, and, and where the Roman Catholic Church like, starts going nuts a little bit, but, you know, he says, <clears throat> Jesus says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Gets the play on words, you know, because Peter is his name, and then the word Petrus means rock. Petricor, the smell of dust after it rains, the same root. It's cool. Okay, so, uh, so that was a little play on words, like, you are Peter, and upon this rock, you... Peter Rock, uh, upon this Petra, I, Petras, I will build my church. Uh, it's the same word as that town, you know, that city in Jordan that's carved into the mountain. Have you ever seen that? It's like an, if you watch uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, mm-hmm. that last thing they go into uh, when they go to actually find the Holy Grail, that's actually filmed in Jordan at the city called Petra. Uh, you can go there, and this amazing city is carved right into the sand, sandstone mountain. It's really neat, and it's been shown and it's like used in all kind of movies as a background because it's like really cool. Has it been in the Transformers too? Probably something like that. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't actually see the Transformers movies. So I don't know. I don't know why I've never seen those, but hmm. I never watched the cartoon when I was a kid either. I don't know why. But yeah, so the, so the city of Petra in Jordan is actually it's called it's called its name means rock because it's carved right in the rock. It's really really neat if you've never seen it before. So, yeah, Jesus doesn't waste time with proclaiming who he is, uh, but he doesn't always do it in plain speech. Sometimes he does it in plain speech, and people still don't believe it when he says it in plain talk. Uh, but that's why, and we're not going to have a whole lot of we're not going to have a whole lot of parables, okay? You're, not, you're going to see you're not going to have parables in John. You see those in Mark. You see those in Matthew. You see them in Luke. In John, you're going to see action. And John is going to use this word. This was a sign that Jesus performed in such and such place at such and such time. And he uses this Greek word, simian, sign. Uh, and there are these different signs that he records that are the witness to his divinity. Uh, and that's what John is going to focus on. So not, not uh, his teachings, not his stories, uh, but rather it will be his teachings, but not his stories. Or you're going to see miracles, and you're going to see signs and wonders, and then you're going to see hard teachings. Like, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not, right? So John is going to do things differently than the other Gospels do. But they don't contradict anything that we see in the others. So we're going to start right off the bat next week with chapter 2 and the wedding at Cana, which has a whole bunch more baptism imagery in it. So again, we're going to have this baptism imagery is going to carry throughout the gospel. I think John shows us like more love than Peter. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, John definitely does that. Yeah, for sure. All right, so we're going to do that, and then uh, we will, yeah, and then we're going to have chapter three. We're going to have Nicodemus talking to Jesus and talking about being born again. It's like, and I know something something Lutherans don't like saying is because American evangelicals have hijacked it. And it's like, well, yeah, unless you're born again, it's like there's nothing wrong with saying born again. That's what happens to you in baptism. You're died, and you're resurrected in a new creation. So, yes, you are born again. It's because some people have ruin that. Well, because people don't want to believe the baptism is what does that. And that's, we'll talk about where they get this idea of this, oh, well, yeah, you have to dedicate your life to Christ to be baptized with water, and then you have to wait to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, and then you're a real Christian. Okay, they're the same thing. But uh, but the Bible says you have to be born of the Holy Spirit, well, because people don't read stuff in the original language. They're just like, they, this is a translation. Stuff gets lost in translation. We'll talk about that. 
you know, that's why we have to learn how to read this. We have to learn how to interpret it. That's why it's important for people to learn the original languages so they can teach other people what it means, right? Uh, but that's where you get the, all these different kind of baptisms. You have to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And then the water baptism is a believer's baptism. That's something you do. Mm, no. This is called misinterpretation. So we're going to start that with this baptism language in the wedding at Cana, Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine. And that's where I'll pick up next week.